Alright, welcome back to the last installment of the series where I'm going to do some uh, showing you how to program and stuff. So I appreciate you sticking around here on a Saturday in the Borg house and uh, going over some code and how it runs. And this last bit, I hope you watched uh, because uh, it's got a lot of good stuff in there with regard to programming and, and uh, how to make things more efficient. So let's get started. The objective of this lecture is to uh, talk about Fortran and more broadly to compare Fortran and MATLAB. And so I'm going to show you how to install it on a Windows machine or on a, a Linux based like machine like this Mac here. And then uh, we're going to talk about why Fortran is faster than MATLAB. <clears throat> I guess I'll do that first. So MATLAB is an interpreted code and Fortran is a compiled code. Uh, Fortran, C, all of those compiled languages versus any kind of scripting language is an interpreted language. So an interpreted language is a programming language which is executed mostly without compiling the program uh, into machine language. So I think this pictorial kind of describes it better. There's kind of two camps here, right? There's a compiled languages. Those are like C plus Fortran or Pascal or Cobalt or any of those compiled languages. And then there's all the interpreted languages, Python, Ruby, Java, MATLAB, Maple, Ease, all of those languages. Uh, those are all compiled. And the main difference is, is that, uh, sorry, those are all interpreted. The main difference is, is in a compiled language, you write the code, what, what you write, and then you give it to the compiler. And the compiler goes through the code and makes sure syntactically it's correct so that it can run. And then it converts that code to uh, a machine language code. There's an intermediate step. It compiles and then it links. It compiles and then if it needs any other script or function that you call, it'll link those into the compiled language and you'll end up with an executable. And that executable then goes right to the machine language and it runs. Whereas um, if you're dealing with an interpreted language, basically what happens is, is that you have uh, the code that you write, the script file, and then it's ready to run, so to speak. But every time it executes one command, it, it has to interpret that to the machine language and, and then to the machine code. So really what's happening is, is it's like when, you, when you're running a compiled language, what you see is, you know, when you're at the top up here where we see the code, you're at the uh, you're even above the with the windows, right? And then uh, when a command runs, this is an interpreter language. It has to pass it to Windows, which then passes it down to the kernel. The, the computer executes that code, and then the result gets passed back up. So it has to go through these steps, and every line goes down, gets executed, comes back up to you, and it pops up onto the screen, whatever the answer is. In a compiled language, right, all the commands are compiled a priori. And it basically turns it into an executable, which is just pure glucose for the for the kernel, right? So when it when you pass the code down to the kernel, it executes all the commands. It doesn't go up and down, up and down, and so it's much much faster to run a compiled language. I mean, MATLAB itself isn't written in MATLAB. It's not written in Java. It's written in C, C and Fortran. I mean, those are the fastest things going, and so any kind of real code is going to be written in Fortran or in C. Uh, the operating system itself is written in C. All right, so uh, enough of that. Let me show you what some Fortran looks like. Well, I guess let me first show you how to install it on your machine. So if you're, if you're running a, uh, a Linux box like this, uh, and again, any the default OS X, uh, for a Mac is essentially it runs on top of Darwin. Darwin is the operating system for Macintosh and then the OS X is the GUI package that sits on top and uh, so what you can do is you can just type sudo port install and then you can say GCC 48 so that's installing the C compiler and you can say and please put in Fortran as well. Boom, so I've already got it installed, so it, it went really fast. That might take longer for you. 
But that's all you have to do to install uh, C and Fortran on your on your Linux box uh, on your Macintosh. And uh, you might have to install Xcode first if you might have already installed Xcode. Now, if you're going to do this on a uh, on a Windows machine, uh, you can run this thing called Force Fortran. And Force Fortran is an open source uh, GUI-like uh, um, emulator for Fortran 77 and 90. What I'm going to show you is Fortran 77. That's what I learned in high school, and that's still pretty much the standard. And um, so you can install this Force Fortran, and uh, I have run it a lot on Windows. It works pretty well. The only problem is, is the guy that wrote it is from Argentina, so the help files are not in English, or they weren't at the time, but that is not a problem at all. There's enough information on the internet about Fortran. All right, so where am I here? I'm in uh, the Octave domain 100 by 60. So uh, over here, I'm in Octave. So let me get out of this. Let's go back a couple of directories. And let's go into the Fortran. And let's go into the higher resolution Fortran. And I've already run it, so there's a bunch of DAT files. Let me just remove those DAT files. Now this file right here is the executable that will create. So let me get rid of the one that I have so I can show you how to create another one. And I will uh, load this. Now typically, right, the extension for Fortran is .f. So that's the Fortran code. And then let me open up the high resolution stream function code. You can see they look very similar here. Now like I said, uh, I'm, uh, what you see on the right is Fortran 77, <clears throat> and um, but it'll pretty much run for Fortran 95 or whatever the latest version of Fortran is. Um, so let's go through it here. In Fortran, you, or at least in Fortran 77, they've gotten rid of this since 90. You know, used to be computer screens. When I was in high school, the computer screens were only 72 characters long. And so when you got to the end of 72 characters, it just rolled over and you started writing on the next line. So Fortran code was written such that uh, it was only 72 characters long. Now, this predates computer screens and goes even to punch cards, which is pretty much right when I started learning to program computers was right when post card, uh, punch cards were leaving. But anyway, that that uh, stayed around a long time. So what it means is, is that you have to write all your code in column seven or higher. So I went ahead and wrote this. You'll see this at a lot of top of a lot of my codes here, uh, that the, the, um, the code itself has to be confined between column seven and 72. If you want to go beyond 72, you can do a wraparound, and I'll show you how to do that. You also have to declare your variables in Fortran, or you used to. This is called static memory allocation, and uh, it's much faster than dynamic memory allocation, which is what MATLAB does. And the reason is this. You know, your RAM is just a long array. It's one array, uh, and there's pointers that point to where the memory is or where your data is in memory. And, and, uh, and it goes in, and it points to the number that you want. So when you ask for a variable, it just goes down to the RAM, finds that variable, and reads it back to you. If you want to make an array, it reserves those uh, numbers in that variable sequentially. So when then you're working with the array, it can quickly, the pointer can move back and forth very quickly to get those numbers. If you use dynamic memory allocation, you build the array yay big, and then you declare some other variables, and then you want to add to the array, it ends up that your array isn't, isn't um, uh, adjacent to each other. And so when you actually run the code, you end up with uh, your pointer is moving all around back and forth, uh, jumping around in RAM, and it's not as efficient as declaring all the memory space at once. So in Fortran, uh, we declare variables at the top, and it also helps anybody else that's running the code. They can see right away what variables, what variables you're using. So uh, I'm going to declare the integers to be uh, these variables here, and by default, in Fortran, variables that start with the letter i to n, including i and n, are integers, because those are the first two letters of the word integer. 
So I'm declaring these guys. And then I'm declaring real numbers, so these can have floating decimal points in them. And, I'm, and this star 4 means declaring it double precision. And there I'm declaring the psi variable, just like we used here. I never have to declare in that lab. That's, that's this whole dynamic memory. And then I'm going to declare a file name uh, that is going to be a set of strings that I can hold 13 characters within that string file name. And I'll show you how that works. All right, so after we do the declare, the two codes are very similar, right? If you go and you look, here's the iStep 2000, here's iStep 2000. Here's the loop where I declare, uh, where I initialize the variables, and here's the loop where I initialize variables. And it's a really good idea to initialize variables because some compilers, when you ask for the array space, if there's already variables in there from whatever, like maybe you run in Microsoft Word and it used that RAM to do something in Microsoft Word, and then you ask for the number that's in that uh, location, it'll just give it back to you. It's not going to necessarily predefine the array space to be zero. So it's always good to define your variables uh, before you use them. And if not, you can get this error, and that's called a memory leak because you, you haven't uh, confined all of your memory. So anyway, uh, I'm defining it to be zero. And the, the for loop in Fortran is a little different syntax. It's do instead of for, and then i equals 1 comma 100 instead of i equals 1 colon 100. And then, you know, that's it. It's just slight syntactical differences, even between Fortran and C. And once you can kind of understand what's going on here, really you can write in any language you want. Um, I actually prefer Fortran for, for a newbie because Fortran is a little more bulletproof than C. C is, is, is more powerful. It's a, it's a um, case-sensitive code, and you can do things like redefine addition if you're not careful. So 1 plus 1 doesn't equal 2 necessarily in Fortran. You can define those operators to be whatever you want. So I think Fortran, for what we want to do with it, is maybe a better code, which is why it continues to persist in the scientific community. And C is a little bit more because of its case sensitiveness and because of its extreme power, uh, it will um, allow you to do things that won't necessarily error trap for you. Like, oh, you want to write over the RAM? No problem. I'll just do whatever you tell me. So I like Fortran for the new programmer. All right, so running through this code, pretty much everything's the same except for syntax here. Instead of for, you're using do. And if we scroll on down to the bottom of the code, the other difference in Fortran is the way that it, it handles I.O., specifically writing to file. So in this code here, if you recall, in the MATLAB code, I built this string by putting these, these, these characters together, psi, num to string of the integer number with six digits, zero padded, dot dat. In Fortran, it's just a little different. What I'm going to do is initially define the variable psi, and remember, uh, we defined file name to be a character string that's, six, that's 13 characters. So this is 13 characters, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. So there's thirteen characters within that file name. Now uh, I write it to the file, I write it to screen so you can see it. And the way writes work in Fortran is uh, we have this write command and this tells it where you want it to write and this tells it what format you want it to write. Um, back initially when uh, computers were first getting going Every device had its own device handle, so to speak. So I can't, I can't remember, but I remember one through ten were reserved. So one was like the keyboard, two was the, I think six was the screen, but it could have been the hard drive. I just can't remember. So those were predefined. Now what we do is we define those numbers ourselves, or we just say the default. Remember, star in the Linux world means a wildcard. So you pick the device, and if it's a write, it will default to the screen, and if it's a read, it will default to the keyboard. And then this default means, well, you pick the format, meaning just write it to screen. I don't care how it's formatted. 
And the reason you want to write format is because you, you've probably opened a data file before, and if it's all lined up character column-wise or, uh, or space or tab delineated, it's very orderly, right? So that's a formatted write. And, uh, and so here it's not being formatted, so your screen will be all, uh, the write file will be all jagged, but I just don't care about that right now. I wanted to show you this syntax. So this is going to write to screen, right? And then when we go to open this file, we're going to assign the handle 33 to it. So according to the computer, or according to this code, your file is going to be 33. So the way it works is you say open, assign unit 33 to it. The file name is file name, so this is what you would put in there. And the format is a formatted file. And so formatted in this sense means an ASCII file. And the status is unknown. That means we don't know if the file exists or not. And so it will uh, write over a file that does exist of that file name, or it will uh, open and create a file that doesn't already exist. And if you just go to any uh, browser here, and you go to Fortran, and you want to know what this syntax is, you can just click on it, right? It shows you the syntax, basically what I just showed you. It allow you to do some error trapping so that you can, uh, if something happens like the file already exists, instead of overwriting it, you can send it to another location in the code and ask the user, hey, do you want to overwrite this? That sort of thing. But it's all down here, like uh, different formats, formatted or unformatted, meaning binary or ASCII, and then uh, status. It could be an old file, a new file, a scratch file, a replace it, or unknown. So those are your kinds of options that you have. But So you can see it's more powerful, right? In MATLAB, it's just going to write over the file. There's no chance to catch that error and uh, write over your data. All right, so this opens the file. So now, from now on, right, it's known as 33. And so here's the do loop that we write. And Fortran's a little clunky when it comes to writing. Every time it does this write command, when it finishes writing, it puts a hard return on your file. And so what you have to do is instead of doing the regular nested do loop, what we do is uh, we do what's called, this is an implied do. And so you're gonna, we're going to march through in the x direction, i equals 1 to 100, and then here comes the line. But instead of having a j loop, I put the j loop right here after the write. Oh boy. Let me undo that. And uh, that way, the hard return exists at the end of the line, after it writes the 1 to 60. So you'll get a line, right? The first line will be all of the J data, and then it'll write, take I equal 2, all of the J data, I equal 2, and so forth. So it'll be a nice organized file. It's not going to be uh, formatted in the sense that it's just going to write the data however it wants to in that file. All right, so it loops around here, and then when it gets done, it closes 33. So that's it. That's really the difference. Uh, instead of having this syntax for MATLAB, we have kind of this syntax for Fortran. And then it goes through, and it does the same looping here where it solves uh, using the stencil. And here I've, I'm showing you how to use the wraparound command in Fortran. So remember I said that you can't go past 72. So if I try to go past 72, this is, uh, this is VI, and VI recognizes this automatically as a uh, Fortran file. So you can see I'm getting close to it. And then it, when it gets up to 72, see how that's gone yellow? That, that means because VI is like, hey, uh, you're having code beyond 72, and uh, that is going to result in a problem. So it highlighted it there for me. The same way on this end. If I were to have what appears to be real source code uh, where it doesn't belong, it will highlight it for me. So 7 to 72 is reserved for the source code. Column 1 is reserved for comment. So if I put a, any kind of character, an ASCII character in column 1, it'll make that whole line commented out. Uh, 2, 3, 4, 5 are reserved for line numbers, which is kind of old school code. Um, people don't use line numbers much anymore. But um, 
they still exist. And then finally, uh, column six is reserved for line wraparound. So what this means is uh, I'm, I want this to appear as one line. So when the compiler sees this, it will cut this here and place it there. So it'll recognize that as one line. So you can have a really long math formula all written out line after line after line, but you have to put an indicator in column six to say this is a continuation from the previous line. And uh, this is, of course, our stencil that you recognize from before. All right, now the last thing that's kind of cool is, is that remember I showed you this logic in MATLAB where uh, I'm using taking advantage of the integer versus uh, real math. And instead of using INT16, which is the, which is uh, here, which is MATLAB for give me the integer value of this, um, I'm using float in. So float means uh, make me a double precision number, float the decimal place, basically. And then 50, and it's important that I put the decimal point there. So this 50, MATLAB, uh, uh, Fortran will recognize as an integer. This 50, it recognizes it as a real number. And real numbers are more computationally intensive, so that's a longer operation than an integer, uh, than integer math. It's just the way the algorithms work out. So uh, use the decimal places, you know, use the decimal point. They actually mean stuff in, in Fortran and C. It means this is a real number and this is an integer number. All right, so I'm doing something kind of tricky here. Look what I'm doing. Uh, here's how I built the file name in MATLAB. Here's how I'm going to build it in Fortran. I start with the with kind of the template. That's what it is. And then whatever integer number you are, I want to overwrite that, right? So if you're integer number one, I want you to write it right there. So the way we do that is we say write, but instead of saying like what I did before, like, hey, just write to wherever you want, which is default to screen, I want you to write to this file name, right? So I, I'm writing to screen, I'm writing to uh, the file right here, I'm populating the file, and I'm writing to a variable within Fortran, right? And so it says here, file four colon eight. That means uh, write this number anywhere between one, two, three, four, whoops, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we're overwriting the number, and I'm using the format, which before I just said, well, pick whatever format you want. Now I'm saying I want you to use an integer that is six characters long that is zero padded to six characters, right? So that's very similar to this. This is kind of the, the C version here, and, uh, and this is the Fortran version here. And then here's the actual, actual integer. So it knows when it sees this format that it's looking for an integer, so there it is. And so it writes it into that file. And then later we can use it right here where I reopen file 33. I write it uh, uh, with a new file name, unknown status and format it, and I write it out and then I close it. And because we're looping here, it's important that you close 33, uh, that you don't just leave it open. You'll confuse Fortran. And then depending on the compiler, Maybe you'll to write over that file, maybe it will pen that file, maybe you'll get garbage. So um, it's all important. All right, so that's the code. And you can see it's not that big a deal to switch over and start using Fortran. Um, and I'll show you why you want to do that. If I uh, want to compile it, I'd say gfortran psi.f. And uh, I have a little problem there. I must have overwritten that file name. So there's there, the compiler saying, hey, this code won't compile. Go look at line 36. And it looks like uh, it doesn't like this file name variable. And I can tell you why it doesn't like it. Because it starts with I. And uh, I tried to write character to it. So it doesn't like that, right? If it starts with the variable i, it's expecting an integer, and instead I gave it a bunch of character strings. So that was a problem. So I'll turn it back into file name. I must have accidentally typed over that. And we go back and recompile it, and I get no errors, so it's ready to go, and it has created this a.out file. And so, you know, when you buy a computer code, like when you buy Microsoft Word, that was probably written in C, 
and it's just a computer code that does all the, has all the features that you see in Microsoft Word. And then at Microsoft there in Seattle, they compile this code and it becomes Microsoft Word and they rename this a.out file to whatever Microsoft Word and they sell you this. And this is a bunch of, just a bunch of garbage, right? This is the compiled, this is like, oh, this is a binary file. Do you really want to see it? Like, yeah, just show it to me. See, it's just, we can't read this, but the computer loves it, right? So um, that's the difference between um, a formatted uh, ASCII file, I should say, an ASCII file and a binary file. But uh, the computer, if I send this to the kernel by just saying, uh, I'm going to execute it, then uh, it is going to love it. Now, what did it take? Nine minutes to run this code in MATLAB? That's how long it takes in Fortran. That's pretty crazy, right? <laughs> That's crazy fast. Let's look at that again. This is... Uh, How many iterations did we do? We did 2,000. That took nine minutes. What if I change this to 200,000? Ten times more. I got to recompile it. Nine minutes is what it took in MATLAB. What was that? Ten seconds? Ten times more? I mean, you can't beat Fortran, and MATLAB will never beat Fortran. So, you know, if you're ready to move up in your computational power, then it's time to go to a compiled language. And yes, MATLAB would be faster if we if we wrote it in vectorized form. And uh, I don't know how necessarily to code in vectorized form. And it's also faster, you know, they'll say, well, you can turn M files into C files and then run them. Okay, but it's not that hard just to run Fortran C natively, right, instead of all the little tricks that MATLAB does to try to act like a compiled code. Anyway, it ran, and there's all the DAT files that we created, and uh, I can go in and uh, where am I here? I'm in Octave still, so I got to back up a couple and uh, go into this thing here and then I'm going to show you one more trick vi this plot thing instead of uh, doing what we did before if you recall back over here I had this logic where we were stepping from 0 to 50 uh, 0 to tw uh, 2000 by 50 well I had to know that this was what I step is so I can get a little more clever and I can say, you know what, you could just give me a directory of star dot dat. So again, this is like, this is just like Linux language. So give me every, every dat file that's in the directory and then create a, a variable called files. Now files is what's known as a, um, a data structure. So let me run this down here. So I just executed that. When I do a, a whose, you can see... Here's files right here. It thinks there's 401 things within files. Now, files is a data structure, and, and so you can see that it's listed. It's not a double precision or a character, but a structure. And a structure is a collection of variables. So if I were to list files, this is what it is. It's a variables that has the name, the date, the size, uh, the, the date number, and so that's a distinct date, the status information, the IS directory, I'm not sure what that is, but uh, if you look at, if I were to do a ls minus la here, it's all this sort of data, right? It's the, uh, it's the date and the time and the data. And then this right here, I haven't talked about this before, this is, uh, what these are is uh, who has permission, root root has read write but it doesn't have executable permissions the user has read but no write or executable permissions and uh and anybody else the world this is called or group has read write privileges if i scroll up to a file let's see here 
like here's a directory right this is the backward directory so it has a D right here to let you know it's a directory and then this is our executable that I said that we compiled so you can see that root has read write executable privileges I'm the user uh, and I know that because there's my name right there. I have read and executable privileges, but I can't write to this file because it recognizes it as a binary compile file. And then anybody else that might hack into my computer would also have read and, um, and executable. So that's group, right? And so this is another reason why Linux is way more stable and, uh, and less susceptible to hacking than, than a Microsoft's operating system because there's, there's a distinction about ownership here. All right, so let me run this and uh, All right, so that finished let me um, Close these again. I'm hitting command W here to close these guys and then to get kind of a quick and dirty movie, I can come up here and uh, look at this. I hit spacebar, it opens them, and then I can just scroll and kind of watch this thing evolve. And uh, it has to it has to view them once, and then it puts it in buffer. And then when you view it the second time, it's much faster to look at it. So. I think before, right, we were skipping every 50, we did 2,000 iterations. So it looks like things are not changing at about right around in here somewhere. So that's around uh, 2,500. If we went to 60, that'd be 3,000 iterations, right? It looks like it's pretty much done. Okay. Let's, to be fair, let's take time step 40 from the Fortran solution. Let's compare it to octave time step 40. So I'm not sure which is which here, but they're going to be identical, right? So you can see that they're pretty much identical, but they're quite different than, uh, than the, the uh, low resolution time step 40, which we saw, saw earlier. All right. So that's pretty cool. And then the last thing maybe I thought I would show you is uh, is making these movies. And this time I thought I would show you just something a little bit different. I thought I'd show you image magic. go into the high resolution and let's uh, do that again so there it generated it and now let's open that movie it's a little bit bigger there it is I can play that and you can see that it, that's pretty cool looking I think this will even do an animated gif but I'm not a hundred percent sure Yeah, so this is those, these are kind of neat because this is an animated GIF, so you can see that it's uh, right. It's just playing uh, by having it open, so you could pip, pop this in a, a presentation or whatnot. And really, an animated GIF is just a series of images. So, all right, I think that's enough for today. And I'm going to continue as I show you more of these computer lab kind of videos, kind of tips about how to run uh, on the Linux environment because it is way more powerful than running uh, than using Excel or whatnot to uh, to try to generate videos and things. All right, so I hope you enjoyed this series and uh, we'll see you again next time. All right, bye-bye.